What does the Mediterranean, letters, the printing press, and rain have in common? Jolly good. Another episode of Bridgerton. Cheerio, everyone. Good day to you all. This is D, Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, I'm coming to you all with our last episode of Bridgerton, Season 1, Episode 8, After the Rain. This episode was directed by Ulrich Riley, who also directed our previous episode. And now, let us commence. So we open up this episode with Mr. Granville painting a portrait of the new Duke and Duchess of Hastings. Naturally, there's still a lot of tension between them and it's being reflected in their body language. Mr. Granville suggests that they move closer, but things are still off. Mr. Granville is still not feeling it, so he suggests that the Duke place his hand on Daphne's shoulder. And of course, once they do that, that good old chemistry, as always, is still there. And Mr. Granville is amazed by how they both look like the picture of devotion even if that isn't reflected in their actual lives. We hit our title credit, and then we jump over to the Bridgerton estate, where Eloise is speaking to Benedict and trying to drop some hints about Madame Delacroix. Benedict assumes that Eloise is trying to sway him from pursuing Madame Delacroix because of her social status and standing. Unfortunately for Eloise, it wouldn't really behoove her to let him know that, hey, your girlfriend's Lady Whistledown, so she decides to leave it alone for now. Then the Viscountess announces that Francesca will be arriving back from her visit with relatives. And I was like, Francesca? I had completely forgotten about Francesca. She literally made an appearance in the first episode and then I literally did not see her again. And it's like, boom, now she's back. And she's missed quite a bit while she's been away. We then see Penelope over at the Featherington home and she visits Marina, who thankfully is very much alive. She's happy that the tea has accomplished its mission. Now that she's no longer with child, she can move on with the rest of her life. Well, that is until she realizes that a certain gentleman caller has arrived at the house. And from the look on her face, it is not someone that she's pleased to see. Next, we see Daphne and her mother out at the market, and Daphne is telling her mother of her and the Duke's plans to live separate lives. Naturally, the Viscountess is trying to dissuade her, but then who should show up but Lady Featherington? And in a not so subtle manner, she lets the Viscountess know how upset her daughters are at having not received an invitation to the upcoming ball this Friday. And the Viscountess says, perhaps you should take a moment to consider the situation that you created that caused all of this. But Daphne feels differently. She has no problem extending an invitation because she's ready to forgive the errors of the past. Of course, Lady Featherington is quite overjoyed at this news. Then Lady Featherington is told by her housekeeper that a carriage has arrived at the house and that a Sir Crane has come to visit. And Daphne's like, that's not a Sir George Crane, is it? Well, not exactly. As a matter of fact, it's Sir Philip Crane, who is George's brother. And he has important yet tragic news to share. Sadly, we find out that George has died on the battlefield several weeks beforehand. And what's even worse is that before he died, he was attempting to write to Marina, telling her how excited he was for them to run away and begin a new life together and raise their child in happiness. So this whole time, Marina assumed that he had abandoned her and it actually was the complete opposite. We then see Eloise bust in on the modiste under the guise of purchasing another dress. And she is doing her best to grill Madame Delacroix, aka Genevieve, about her obvious identity as Lady Whistledown. And for a second, it looks like she might be on target. There is just this really weird coded way that Madame Delacroix is speaking to Eloise and the expression on her face is just kind of like, mm, wait a minute now. So eventually Eloise leaves. But what she doesn't realize is that Benedict has been there with Madame Delacroix the entire time. Later, Daphne attempts to broach the subject of the Duke, his father, and all the horrible things that happened in his childhood that led up to him taking that vow. But it's a no-go. At this point, the Duke just feels like Daphne would just be better off without him. Then we fast forward to Will's latest match, and we can see that Will is still very much undecided about how he should approach things. Should he keep his honor and win, or should he take the money and lose? Speaking of which, Lord Featherington is also there, and he is speaking to some very unsavory looking men about placing a more serious wager. But to them, of course, his word is no good. So then, Lord Featherington takes it a step further and offers them the deed to his house. So if he loses, his house is forfeit to these men. I was like, oh my god. So we have just learned nothing from this past situation. It wasn't enough that you gambled away all this money, 
your daughter's dowries, like all of this. But now the one solid concrete thing you have, a house, you're going to gamble that away too. I just, okay. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. And I get what he's trying to do, but you don't know the outcome. And that's the thing about gambling and why I'm so thankful to not have a gambling addiction because that, oh, like you can end up in a really messed up situation. And I just, oh, this isn't looking good. Back of the Featheringtons, it appears that Sir Philip has a proposal for Marina, as in a proposal of marriage. He figures, considering the situation with his brother, that it would be his duty to marry and provide for her. But Marina is not interested. She doesn't love this man. She doesn't even know him. And at this point, I was just like, maybe you should just go for it. Because considering what she's been through, considering the potential situations and marriages she could have been in prior to now, I was just like, this is not bad in my opinion. I would just go for it. But of course, Marina is going to be Marina. So we'll see how that pans out. Back at Cliveden, Daphne does a little digging around, and eventually she's able to discover many of the correspondences between Simon and his father throughout his childhood. So back at Will's match, Anthony is eyeing Sienna as usual. Eventually, his and Sienna's eyes lock, and pretty soon, they're underneath the stands getting it in. I was, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Not in a public place underneath the stands. But then again, this is Anthony and Sienna we're talking about, so... Why am I even surprised? <laughs> Let me also say that I really loved what Anthony was wearing. I loved that deep blue with the hat and the whole styling of that. I was so into that. Like if I could play a character in a costume drama, that would be my outfit right there. <laughs> and as far as the match is concerned, in the end, Will decides to do what's in his best interest and he throws the match. Lord Featherington is visibly overjoyed because he has won all his money back and then some. However, the Duke is not at all blind to what has just taken place. Daphne is still reading through letters when she's startled by Lady Danbury, who is there to assist with preparations for the ball. Daphne takes the initiative and she asks Lady Danbury about Simon's childhood and his upbringing, and she provides enough detail for Daphne to truly understand just how deep the Duke's inner turmoil really runs. Speaking of Simon, we see him confronting Will over his loss at the match. And he's not happy about it. He's like, you know, I would have given you the money. What about your wife? What about your family? What about your honor? And Will is very frank. All that attention you're giving me in my marriage, you need to put towards your own. Because ultimately, all this anger that you have, it's not about me. Daphne and the Duke end up sharing breakfast in the same room for the first time in a while. Daphne shares that she'll be traveling to her family home to see Francesca and that she would like the Duke to join her. And he accepts the invitation. And later we see everyone meeting up at the Bridgerton home and Francesca is excited to have returned to not just four brothers, but five. Eloise and Benedict are having a little tete-a-tete -tete over Genevieve when Anthony comes over and sits down. And he really wants to know what they're discussing. So Benedict comes right out and announces, I'm in a relationship with Madame Delacroix. And Anthony is just like, well, good for you. And Eloise and Bennett are like, huh? <laughs> yeah, you like it? It brings you contentment? Then that's great. Do what works for you. Clearly, this is a different Anthony than we've seen throughout this season. <laughs> Over the Featherington home, while Philippa, Prudence, and Penelope have all received new dresses for the ball, Marina has a sudden shock and has to call for the doctor. And unsurprisingly, at least to me, the doctor informs her that, yeah, that tea didn't do what you thought it did. You are still very much with child. <laughs> I was just like, I swear, Marina just cannot catch a break. We also see that Anthony and Sienna have picked up where they left off, and Anthony takes it a step further and asks if she'll run away with him tonight. Sienna looks skeptical, but she also looks as if she might be considering it. So the Cliveden Ball is about to commence, and we see Daphne and Simon, and they are looking at their first portrait as the new Duke and Duchess of Hastings. And it's interesting because as they're discussing it, it seems like for the first time in a really long time, they have their witty repartee back, and they seem to be in a really good space. Daphne remarks on how good the Duke was with her younger siblings, Gregory and Hyacinth, when they were visiting. And he's like, well, I still don't want any of my own. And I was just like, okay, like, can we just stay in the moment can we be positive? I just feel like no one was talking about that at all. And it's just like, okay, this is what I'm talking about. Like every time we take a few steps forward, we immediately take 10 steps back. It's just <laughs> these two. But there's no more time to chat. The guests are officially arriving. Once again, we have a really good setup for the ball. 
the flowers, the ivy, the dance floor, the entire setup, really, really nice. As I've always said, I enjoy the production design and the aesthetics of this show. Eloise enters the party with the Viscountess, and naturally she is still struggling with the idea of being out in public in these ball gowns and being sociable. It's just not her scene at all. Daphne walks over and tells Eloise that for someone who can't stand to be in a ball gown, you look exquisite in one. And she also tells her, hey, you want to spend the rest of your time upstairs in the library? I will totally understand. <laughs> I'm just glad you're here. And before Daphne walks off, Eloise thanks her. For what? For being so perfect so that Eloise wouldn't have to be. Then, as Lady Featherington and her daughters arrive, we see Lord Featherington elsewhere entering a room where the men that he made a wager with are waiting for him. This does not look good. Benedict approaches Penelope and he apologizes to her for not seeing that she was just trying to protect him. Penelope says you don't have anything to apologize for. You were just a man in love. Speaking of love, well, Penelope has something to tell Colin. But before she can express her true feelings, Colin lets her know that he'll be leaving. He'll be joining a tour in the Mediterranean and it's Penelope he has to thank for inspiring him to do that. He even asks Penelope if she would like to dance, but Penelope is so overcome by all this new information, she just wishes him well on his journey, and she rushes off. Eloise attempts to broach another conversation with the Queen about Lady Whistledown, but then her right-hand man, Brimsley, blocks her and tells her to not approach the Queen. She's like, well, I request an audience. He's like, oh, well, in that case, no. Eloise is like, okay, I just wanted to personally thank her for giving me the opportunity to investigate Lady Whistledown's identity for her. But she's more than capable, and I'm sure she'll be unmasking her very, very soon. And then Eloise starts to compliment Brimsley for assisting the Queen in being such a man of talent and genius. And since the little flattery goes a long way, Brimsley lets Eloise know, we figured out that she operates through a certain printing press on Lombard Street, especially when the rest of society is distracted by big events like this one. So upon realizing this, Eloise bribes one of her coachmen and she rushes off to warn Lady Whistledown of what's coming. Anthony arrives to see Sienna, assuming that she's ready to run off with him, but it's her gentleman friend that opens the door. Sienna walks up and asks the man to give her and Anthony a minute, and she lets him know that she did think about actually coming with him. But in the end, she realized that her own future is the only thing that she can be responsible for. She knows now that Anthony is lost, and she cannot allow him to set her adrift as well. More importantly, the man she's with now, he sees her for who she is, and he doesn't want her to change. So, it's time for you to let me go. And even though there are tears in both of their eyes, Anthony finally accepts that this is the end of the road for he and Sienna. Over at the printing press, Eloise is waiting, hoping to see Lady Whistledown. And then a carriage with a hooded figure suddenly pulls up. And just as Eloise begins to walk up to the carriage, she suddenly realizes that somebody is running towards their exact location. So she quickly warns Lady Whistledown, hey, 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 they're coming. You gotta go, you gotta go. So the coachman hits the reins and they're off. The man runs up to Eloise and he's like, what are you doing? She's like, uh, I thought you were someone else, but I think you can still catch her. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Played that very well, but at that point, Lady Whistledown has already escaped. Back at the ball, Lady Danbury speaks to the Duke about his plans to separate from Daphne. She also lets him know that pride will cost you everything and leave you with nothing. And I was like, come on with the wisdom. <laughs> True words have never been spoken. And across the room, the Viscountess is speaking to Daphne, and she tells her just how much she misses the Viscount Bridgerton, her late husband. She lets Daphne know that they loved each other very much, but they also had obstacles and trials to work through, and they eventually overcame them. But that's because we chose to love each other every single day. And that is a choice that is never too late to make. But Daphne is panicking. She's like, I think it's too late. I don't think I can. And the Viscountess just tells her, you are a Bridgerton. There is nothing that you cannot do. And I'm like, come on, once again. The Viscountess coming with that real talk, that motherly encouragement, love it. <laughs> so Daphne walks over to the Duke and it is time for their last dance. And it's so funny because we have really come full circle from that first dance at the end of the first episode. But then all of a sudden it starts to rain and everyone clears the floor. The Duke grabs Daphne's hand to take shelter, but she just stands there and she is really embracing this moment. And the Duke also sees that, so he stays there with her. And we can see that Philippa and Albius are about to join them. And then Lady Danbury is like, uh-uh. <laughs> I don't think so. She puts her cane out and she's like, all right, everybody, I do believe the evening is complete. We shall thank her host for such a gracious event in the morning. Goodbye. <laughs> so now it is just the Duke and the Duchess. 
and Daphne lets the Duke know, I've read everything, I know all about it, I understand. I know why you made this vow, but just because something isn't perfect doesn't mean it isn't any less worthy of love. Your father made you believe that you needed to be without fault in order to be loved, but he was wrong. I can't sit here and act like I don't love you because I do. Even the parts you think are too dark and too shameful. Every flaw. Every imperfection. But you can choose differently. You can choose to be happy and love me the way that I love you. But nobody else can make that choice but you. And I was like, you better say that, Daphne. <laughs> I was here for it. And I loved it because it was almost like a direct parallel to when Daphne and the Duke were making their appeal to the queen and the Duke completely blindsides her with that speech. And so, whereas it was him kind of letting her know this is how I really feel, it's her now doing the same. Like, this is it, this is the decision, this is how I feel, what you gonna do now? Lady Featherington and her daughters return home and they are all the buzz about the ball and possibly doing renovations for the summer. But then they see the staff all standing around as if something has happened. The housekeeper walks up and lets Lady Featherington know that they're saying that Lord Featherington is dead. And immediately, Lady Featherington rushes into the study. And of course, the deed to the house is gone. So now that her husband's life and her house is forfeit, what future is there going to be for her and her daughters now? And she begins to break down in tears. And I felt bad. I know that the Featheringtons have been a trip, but on some level, I was always kind of rooting for them just because they were such a mess. And you can see that they were really trying to make things happen for themselves, even with their social standing and their clothes and them really not being in step with the rest of society. But, you know, I was wanting to see them excel. But now that this has happened, it's just like, I have no idea what's going to happen now. Later, we see Simon approach Daphne and he flat out lets her know that I don't know how to be the man that you deserve. She says, it's simple. You stay and we get through it. And it is that simple. They reconcile, which means what? That they're doing what they always do best. <laughs> what they have done countless times throughout this series. All is well with the Duke and Duchess of Hastings. <laughs> and as the social season comes to a close, we see Colin leave for his trip while Eloise comforts Penelope in the wake of her father's passing. But Penelope also tells Eloise that with Lady Whistledown still on the loose, next season will be far more interesting. And I love that little wink at the audience there. Yes, the next social season, but also the next season of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Lady Featherington is looking at her husband's bedroom in the wake of his passing. And Marina just wants to know how she managed to endure so many years of marriage without love. And she says, you learn to love small things and even big things like your children. And eventually it all adds up. And she tells Marina, you're strong, stronger even than me. And I think you'll do well. So next we see Marina leaving with Sir Philip for a new life with her and her child. Penelope and surprisingly, Philip and Prudence are actually sad to see her go. And then the housekeeper comes and informs Lady Featherington of the man who will inherit the Featherington estate. She hands Lady Featherington a slip of paper. She looks at the name on the paper and from the look on her face, it would appear that the Featherington family have just gone from the frying pan into the fire. Across the street, the Bridgerton family is seeing Colin off, and before he leaves, Anthony announces his intentions to find his Viscountess. He says, I should be fine. All I have to do is remove love from the equation and everything will fall into place. And Daphne and the Duke are just like, okay. Benedict tells Eloise that Madame Delacroix will be making a short trip back to France. Eloise is like, oh, you're not gonna say goodbye to her? And he's like, oh, I already did last night when we were out at a party. Eloise is like, wait, you and Madame Delacroix were out at a party last night? Then, then that means, yep, the real Lady Whistledown is still out there. And as the episode closes out, we hear Lady Whistledown saying that she's become aware of a scheme to unmask me by a very worthy opponent. Perhaps I will come forward one day. Though you must know, dear reader, that decision shall be left entirely up to me. So then we see a hooded figure inside of a carriage and I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, we're closing out and I'm sure we'll find out who Lady Whistledown is next season. Oh no, the figure throws her hood back and of all the people I might've expected to be under that hood, it is none other than Penelope Featherington. 
Yours truly, Lady Whistledown. Cut to black. Oh, 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 oh my gosh. I just, I don't know. There were so many options. There were so many different people that it could have been. And really in my mind, I just kind of let it go. And I was like, okay, I'll just see what happens. And I wasn't really thinking ahead to who it could be. Kind of saw it a little bit with Madame Delacroix. Even kind of saw it a little bit with Eloise. But there was no one where I was just like, who could it be concretely to where it wouldn't be too obvious and it wouldn't be too like off the mark for them to do it. And Penelope never saw it coming. And what's really crazy is knowing that she had a hand in all the stuff that happened throughout the season. So it is going to be so interesting to rewatch knowing this and just seeing how she moves throughout the show. Like, wow. I just, maybe other people saw it coming, but I totally didn't pick up on it. So kudos to the writers, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I, just, I don't even know what to say. And then we also get an epilogue scene of sorts where we see Daphne giving birth to the future Duke of Hastings. And although they don't have a name yet, that name will start with the letter A following the family's alphabetical tradition. And that closes out episode eight, Off to the Rain. And that closes out season one. I do have to say, although this show for me was kind of eh at first, it definitely got much, much better as we went along. I started to identify with the characters. I started to enjoy, you know, kind of the twists and turns of the story and the way it ended. I just, I think it was a pretty solid season overall. If there was anything I would say that I wasn't the biggest fan of, I didn't really like the way Marina's storyline was handled. I just figured for her to be the one black female central character on the show, it just, for her to be lumped in with this very tragic kind of messed up story, it just was kind of like, it just was really uncomfortable to watch, mainly because there was no dynamic to her character other than her like crying or being upset the entire time. And even when we see her at the end, she's in a better circumstance, but she still almost looks unhappy. So I just kind of think that that could have been done differently. I wasn't the biggest fan of it, even though I think the actress who portrayed her did a really great job. And the actress's name is Ruby Barker. And then as far as the costumes, I just think we could have pushed it a little bit more. They weren't bad, but from what I've seen of the Regency era and seeing other productions and shows and movies and all that, we could have really like gone all out. I hope that next season we can really just push it with the design and that was very evident to me in that episode where Daphne kind of makes her big appearance and there was nothing really like boom in your face about it. And I think that kind of soured the moment a little bit. It's like, this needs to be like a show stopping moment. And I just think the costumes overall needed more of that quality. And although they were fine, I would love if they were a lot more opulent next season. But other than that, I really had a good time watching this. It was a very feel-good show. Something that's not too dark and too edgy, but just something that's kind of like the right tone. There were like little dark elements here and there, but for the most part, it was very lighthearted, very enjoyable, you know, comedic and humorous. And I really, really loved that. And so just to give you guys a little news and information about the show, 82 million people watched this show, which means it is the most watched show ever on Netflix. So as a result, the show has been renewed not only for a second season, but also for a third and fourth. And apparently these upcoming seasons, much like the books, they'll be covering a different Bridgerton sibling or child, which means that the second season will be centered around Anthony and his search for his Viscountess. I also heard that Regé Jean Page will not be a part of the second season. Now for me, the way that they ended this season, in my mind, I didn't see him coming back. But also I think it's one of those situations where they had him on the show and I guess they didn't realize just how popular the show or his character specifically would become. So now, you know, trying to get him to come back after he's now blown up and he has all these other films, it's like kind of challenging. So for me, it's not as much of an issue because I did enjoy the Duke as a character, but I kind of felt like the story came to a close. And since these other seasons, much like the books, are covering other characters and they're becoming central, I just didn't see where he was going to fit in outside of a few appearances. And then of course, I'm not like the main demographic of this show. So it wasn't like, oh my gosh, the Duke, the Duke, you know, like he's a cool character, but it's not like I was there just for his looks. Or, you know, I wasn't there for that. I thought I, I liked him because he was a cool character and I liked his dialogue and all that. But the rest of y'all, you know, the Duke being gone is just like, oh, 
<laughs> blasphemy, <laughs> sacrilege, the end of the world. <laughs> so yeah, but I think it'll be a good season regardless. And then possibly in the third season, he might make another appearance to probably give him some more money and things will work out. So I just think one season without his character, I think it'll be fine. And lastly, before I close out, I just wanted to thank everybody that has watched, has supported, has commented. This show came back out in December and I really didn't get the idea to recap it or even attempt to recap it until February. So I was already a little off base. And then as I continued on, I kind of realized, oh, people actually enjoy hearing what I have to say about this show, which is surprising because I just figured I was too late or I took too long and now other shows are on. But I really do appreciate the encouragement from everyone who has supported and watched and enjoyed these recaps. I am so, so appreciative and I'm glad because it lets me know that, you know, it's never too late. You know, there's always an audience. There's always someone there who's willing to watch and support and tune in. So that's a really big encouragement to me. And especially because it took me a while to kind of get through the season because I started off this channel doing recaps of the HBO series Insecure, which is a 30 minute show. But with this show, which is almost an hour and all these story threads and all these characters, it was a little harder to kind of get through it and be more consistent. So once again, thank you guys for hanging in there. Thank you for continuing to tune in for being patient with me, for, you know, just continuing to watch and support in general. But I'm very, very appreciative. I will absolutely be recapping the second season whenever it comes out. They're actually filming right now. So hopefully we can get the second season by this Christmas, hopefully. And it'll just be a year from the first season premiere. So that would be really great. So I absolutely cannot wait for the second season and to start recapping that. If anyone is interested, I'm also currently recapping the Netflix series Bling Empire, which also premiered on Christmas with Bridgerton. And that's also a pretty solid show, very different from Bridgerton. It's very much a modern reality show take on Crazy Rich Asians and that film and that whole story and dynamic. But it's a show that I find is really, really interesting and it goes beyond just money and wealth and all that kind of stuff. So if you guys are interested in checking that show out and or watching my recaps for that, you guys can go ahead and catch up. I'm about to end the season very soon and I've enjoyed recapping that as well. So just in general, very grateful, very appreciative, and thank you guys for continuing to support. So once again, this is D Movie Man signing off and I'll see you with the movies.